Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Big Hurricane Baptist Church. We are so glad you're here. Now, if you're a guest with us, we'd love for you to fill out that little connect card that one of our handsome ushers back there will give you, and uh, just drop that in the plate. Uh, you can fill it out also online. Thank you if you update any information for us. That will also help. We're making a record now where we can uh, take care of you better and uh, make you feel right at home. So please do that if you have not already. Um, today we have at least one birthday. Walker, stand up. Teresa Stone, also stand. We're going to sing to you. Miss Glenn is going to play for us. We are going to sing you happy birthday. Any other birthdays? All right. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday to you. All right. Good job. Great, great. Um, for this month for our um, Operation Christmas Child, we are donating stuffed animals and action figures. So if you have those, want to bring them, drop them in the bucket in the back. We're making quite a nice selection of things, a collection of things that we will have available for you in November to pack, maybe before then. And we are eager uh, to get those things together and to make some really great shoeboxes this year. I wanted to tell you about an opportunity coming up that uh, you, some of you may want to take uh, advantage of. July the 22nd through the 26th, there will be a mission trip going to Paducah, Kentucky to do light um, construction, everything from painting to uh, framing and sheetrock and stuff like that. But if you've never been on one, this is for adults. We would love to take men and women, and uh, that is paid for. The trip is of no cost to you except travel meals to Kentucky. So it depends how long it takes us to get there and how much you want to eat uh, on the way there. But your lodging and um, uh, your fees, everything is taken care of. And we'd love for you to be part of that. Please see me as soon as possible. They're collecting up now. They're going to be having team members together. But it will be a light construction work in Paducah, Kentucky. It will be a great opportunity in July, 22nd through the 26th. Vacation Bible School starts tomorrow. Yay. <laughs> children. Any children in here? Raise your hand if you're a child. Okay. Raise your hand, children. This is the time and this is the day that you invite your friends. Invite your friends and tell them to come with you. Your mom will go get them. Invite them to come with you to Vacation Bible School tomorrow night, 6 o'clock. 6 o'clock. 5.30. 5.30. Uh, tomorrow night. Come tomorrow night. We'd love for you to participate in that. What that means is we've got a week-long vacation Bible school, very exciting things planned and ready to go for you. So please be here, kids, for Bible school. Bring all of your friends. Um, tonight, there will not be worship services, but there will be a meeting of all the teachers and directors and those people involved in vacation Bible school to finish up the planning and decorations. So we'll do that tonight. Uh, there will be ESL this evening. Okay, other announcements? I do have an announcement. Um, Addie Bosch. Addie, would you please stand? She loves to stand. Addie has entered into the early program, the early college program at the University of Alabama. We want to give her a big hand. As she prepares to do those online courses and those things, how very exciting. Congratulations, Addie. Other announcements we need to make this morning. Yes. Teresa?
Very good. Thank you so much. Yes, please. Okay. September 21st. Okay. All right. We'll do that. We'll remember that. Put that down. Good stuff. Thank you so much for coming this morning. Our scripture reading uh, will be by Miss Jackie Michael. Jackie, would you come and read for us? I'm going to read Isaiah 53, 7 through 9. He was oppressed, he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before it shears is silent. From prison and from judgment, and who would declare his generations? For he was cut off from the land of the living, for the of my people he was stricken. And they made his grave with the wicked, but and they made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich he was there, because he had done no things. With me, our Father, we thank you so much for your wonderful love that you sent to us, Jesus, prophesied, predicted by Isaiah centuries before. Thank you for the truth of the Scripture and the power of that truth as it changes and touches us. Help us as we worship and lift you up today that you would be honored and glorified. In the name of our wonderful Savior Jesus, amen. Okay, this morning, there's the musician. Go for it, Todd. Oh, we're going to greet. We have to greet. Stand and greet, please. We've got to get the PowerPoint switched over here, but, but everybody stand. We're going to sing a song called Whom Shall I Fear? And I sang this song about a month ago, I think, when I was here. So it says, you hear me when I call, you are my morning song. Though darkness fills the night, it cannot hide the light. Whom shall I fear? So we're going to get started on it here. 
shortly. Here we go. Always by my side. Right. Uh, remain standing and and and, and saying shit. Sh- My Jesus, my Savior, Lord, there is none like you. All of my days, I want to praise the wonders of your mighty love. My comfort, my shelter, Tower of refuge and strength, let every breath, all that I am, never cease to worship you. 
Shout to the Lord, all the earth, let us sing. Power and majesty, praise to the King. Mountains bow down and the seas will roar at the sound of your name. I sing for joy at the work of your hands forever i'll love you forever i'll stand nothing compares to the promise i have in you my jesus my savior Lord, there is none like you. All of my days, I want to praise the wonders of your mighty love. My comfort, my shelter. My comfort, my shelter. Power of refuge and strength. Let every breath, all that I am, never cease to worship you. Shout to the Lord, all the earth, let us sing. Power and majesty, praise to the King. Mountains bow down and the seas will roar at the sound of your name. I sing for joy at the work of your hands. Forever I'll love you, forever I'll stand. Nothing compares to the promise I have in. Shout to the Lord, all the earth, let us sing. Power and majesty, praise to the King. Mountains bow down and the seas will roar at the sound of your name i sing for joy at the work of your hands forever i'll love you forever i'll stand nothing compares to the promise i have in nothing compares to the promise i have in Nothing compares to the promise I have in you. Maybe see. Right, this next song is a song that I wrote, and it's a, a simple song, and I, I think you guys can fo can follow along. Praise to the Father. Praise the Son, praise to the Spirit, three in one. Praise to the Father, praise the Lamb, praise to the host and the great I Am. Praise to the Father, praise the Son, praise to the Spirit, three in one. Praise to the Father. Praise the Lamb, praise to the host, and the great I am. Let's go to the hymn.
my sorrows he made them his very own he bore the burden to calvary and suffered and died alone singing how marvelous how wonderful and my song shall ever be how marvelous how wonderful my Savior's love for me. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me.
thousand generations falling down in worship to sing the song to the Lamb. And all who've gone before us and all who will believe sing the song of ages to the Lamb. Your name is the highest. Your name is the greatest. Your name stands above them all. All thrones and dominions, all powers and positions, your name stands above them all. And the angels cry, oh, holy, all creation cries, oh, holy, you are lifted high, oh, Holy forever. And if you've been forgiven, and if you've been redeemed, sing the song forever to the Lamb. And if you walk in freedom, and if you bear his name, Sing the song forever to the Lamb. Sing the song forever and amen. And the angels cry, Holy, all creation cries, Holy, you are lifted high. King of kings, oh, holy, you will always be, oh, holy, holy forever. Your name is the highest, your name is the greatest, your name stands above them all all thrones and dominions all powers and positions your name stands above them all and the angels cry oh holy all creation cries oh holy you were lifted high, oh, holy, holy forever. And the angels cry, oh, holy, all creation cries, oh, holy, you were lifted high. Holy, holy forever. All creatures cry. Oh, holy, holy of kings. Oh, holy, praise be.
to Rio de Janeiro. And we had prepared uh, to sing Shout to the Lord. What was new, it was just like hot off the press. This was like the song everybody was singing. We had prepared it, and we got there to sing it, a group of about 26. It was a medical team, a large team. And Sunday morning comes, and we're ready to go, and we're ready to stand up there and sing this song. And the guy comes to me, and he says, what are you singing? And, you know, we try to name some things and shout to the Lord. I said, we're going to sing shout to the Lord. He said, well, we'll sing it with you in Portuguese. <clears throat> I said, well, we don't know it in Portuguese. <laughs> he said, it doesn't matter. Go ahead and sing it in English. You won't even hear yourself. He was right. <laughs> they sang that song in Portuguese. It was overwhelming. I get chills thinking about it today. And our folks sang it just as loud as they could in English. You couldn't hear one of them. But that song has been sung truly, literally, around the world. It's a magnificent song. And thank you so much for singing it so well today right here. Pray with me, please. Father, thank you so much for the gifts you give to us and the joy that we share as we come to bring to you an expression of our love for you, a, a token of all that you've given to us, a small portion that means uh, we love you, we thank you, and we appreciate the gifts you give us. So receive it, please, in, uh, with our deepest gratitude for all the gifts you give us that go beyond measure, and we will trust you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Children, thank you so much for coming, and workers for helping them. This morning I want to share with you a very prevalent idea in the scriptures about vulnerability, sent to be vulnerable, and we are, and we realize how true to the spirit of our master this is, sent to be vulnerable. We go out, and we don't know what will happen, but we trust him, and we're grateful for his protection and care. Jesus speaks to us from Matthew chapter 10 about this idea but I also wanted to pick up James and, um, and Philippians, uh, and we'll follow those in order. But just a verse, uh, Matthew, 10, uh, 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 Matthew 10, verse 16. The American Standard uh, New English Version says it this way. Behold, I am sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. So be wise as serpents and innocent King James says, harmless as doves. The next passage uh, is from James. I wanted to read that one in this place. James chapter 1, <clears throat> verse 17. Uh, 27, verse 1, uh, verse 27 of chapter 1 of James. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction, and to keep oneself unstained from the world. And then the last passage, which pretty much is a commentary on the other two about how to be vulnerable, it is with regard to the great passage from Philippians about the mind of Christ. Um, so, uh, from Philippians chapter 2, 5 through 8. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God as a thing to be grasped, 
but he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant. This is a human, a, be, a human being, being born in the likeness of men and being found in the human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Will you pray with me? <clears throat> Our Father, we come today ready to be sent by you, realizing that there may be certain costs to that. There may be difficulty in being heard. No different from our Master who came and who spoke and was rejected of men. We thank you for even the prophet who saw ahead that the Master and his message would be rejected by many, but that there would be some, there would be a few who followed. We pray today that we would be faithful followers and that as we learn the cost of discipleship, that we would be more like our Master, ready to bear the difficulties of the world and help them come to the saving grace of our God. In Jesus' name and for His sake, Amen. When you learn a new language, one of the first things that you try to do is you learn those important phrases. Where's the bathroom is the first one. And then, but the second phrase, probably more important than all the rest, if you're going to do shopping or buy anything, you go to the market, you ask, how much does it cost? How much does this cost? And so you're learning to communicate in the language of the people that you're with, and you're requesting to find out the price of something. What is the price? Very important phrase. Well, it's the same way when uh, you, you meet internationals in our country, they come to you and they unapologetically ask you, how much does that cost? How much does this cost? They want to know what the cost of your house is and what your car is, and they will ask you without uh, shame, uh, what does this cost? We're a little hesitant to try to ask people about the cost of something. To us, it's not real courteous to say, how much does that cost? So, because we don't want to be asked, how much does this cost? And so we kind of have an agreement among us that we don't really, we kind of may hedge up against it and move up close to see if we can find out if it's offered. But we don't generally ask, how much does this cost? In 1937, Dietrich Bonhoeffer wrote a book in call, entitled The Cost of Discipleship. This was on the brink of World War II, uh, the the. Nazi regime had under uh, Germany had begun, and uh, there was a great cost to discipleship. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the great theologian, uh, actually developed this uh, understanding of the cost of discipleship, and he paid the ultimate cost in, with his life. He spent years in prison, and then he died as a result of his faith. <clears throat> When Jesus says this strange verse in uh, Matthew, and he speaks about serpents and doves, we wonder what it means in order to be uh, wise as serpents. What does that mean when Jesus says to us, be wise as serpents? We, what lessons do we take from observing a snake, a serpent? Well, uh, when he sends out the, the, the 70... In Luke chapter 10, it's, it's a parallel to the story that's told in Matthew. He sends them out and he encourages them it, to, to be very, very careful. It's a repetition of the same phrase that Jesus uses here to say, be wise as serpents, harmless as doves, and they were going to be uh, scattered. And, and here's the pattern that, that God scatters us and he brings us back together. He scatters us and he brings us back together. And so it is with the apostles, they are scattered and they are brought back together. At this point in the life of Jesus, he has 70 disciples who are sent out and they have this information. They're told to be wise as serpents, harmless as doves. As you go, these are the things that you're going to have to do. So he is actually saying that he is sending them into peril and that there should be in their operation and in their greeting of people wisdom, prudence, and simplicity at the same time. <clears throat> you, you do not have to be a scholar of Egyptian hieroglyphics 
you can just look at the columns and the pictures and the, the wall of paintings, and you can see very prominent in the writing of hieroglyphics the use of a serpent, and that symbol is the symbol for wisdom, for understanding. It is a prominent figure for cunning, and it, it is probably because the snake does two things very well. One is he blends in. We know this, don't we? We've seen him in the grass. Sometimes we don't see him well in the leaves. And, and then secondly, he knows exactly when to strike. He knows the distance that he can reach. He knows the distance that you are. And in his uh, habitat and in his world, the snake knows these two things without question. He blends in. He knows how to be unseen. And then secondly, he knows when to strike. So there's a little bit of uh, information here that Jesus is saying to them, as we go, we represent wisdom and skill, cunning in avoiding danger, in avoiding uh, difficulties. Jesus actually will chide the Pharisees at one point when He says, you are being silent like serpents, and you're showing wisdom in your silence, probably was the greatest wisdom that they had, was to be silent in the indisputable logic of Jesus Christ. To, that would be the greater part of wisdom, to listen to Him and not try to speak themselves. But among, even among the ancient Hebrews, the serpent was an image of wisdom, it was a symbol of wisdom. Our, our, our interpretation of the garden story is simply one where uh, the, the, the serpent was more crafty, and that's a strange word for us, but he was uh, more cunning than any beast of the field. And we see a certain kind of understanding coming from him there. But it does mean, Jesus is saying to them, you must be prudent in recognizing a dangerous situation. We would say in, in English today, you must be street smart. Think about what you're doing. Think about the group of people you're with, and you need to blend in, and you need to know when to speak. The temptation for self-preservation is very great for us. Too much of this understanding and wisdom, this knowledge, causes us to lead to a protectionism. It causes us to want to save ourselves. I have a friend who has a bunker. I mean, he's got a bunker. It's a real deal. And he has uh, storage in there for food. And, you know, pipe that comes up out of the ground, he can breathe under there. It's more than a, than a fallout shelter. It's more than a tornado shelter. It is a bunker because he's got guns in there. He's got ammo in there. And he is ready. Now, you know, I'm not a survivalist myself. But I'm glad to know where he lives and where his bunker is. He has a bunker. I mean, it's a real deal bunker. And uh, that is a certain frame of mind where you begin, you fall into the line of protecting yourself. You protect yourself with everything that you can. And this is a resistance against the idea that Jesus is putting out. He's not saying become a protective person. There's an animal that is called the pygmy slow loris. This animal is a cute little guy, but he's dangerous because he has a poison gland that he licks. And when he does that, it gets, it gets on his fur. It's under his arm. He licks his fur, and then it gets on his teeth, and he is poisonous now. And his, no one can get near him because he's poisonous. The interesting chemistry behind this is that it's not activated until it's in his saliva. Until his saliva lands where he licks this and, he, and gets on his teeth and in his mouth, he is then extremely dangerous. This is an element that we are tempted to become. We become dangerous when we become self-preserving. Because you have the knowledge of life and salvation that Jesus Christ expects you to communicate to the world. This is not something to be kept to yourself. It means then that you are wise in good things 
and simple in evil things. You do not use your ability to bring evil to pass. You do not, bring, you do not use your knowledge to bring uh, pressure and loss of salvation. You have the keys of the kingdom. And God expects you to take those very precious gifts and to share them. Now, we want to be people who build wisdom in good things. In the good and the godly, Jesus is telling us this. He is also teaching us to be careful and to be wise when we share. Think about the place you are. Think about your surroundings. Think about those who are listening. And go about that with great joy and confidence, with a certainty that God will be with you. The second part of this is be harmless as doves. Be wise as serpents. And harmless as doves. I love this passage, and I have since I was a kid because of the animals in it. But so when you are harmless as a dove, is that connected to being wise as serpents? Yes, it actually is. Here is what Jesus is communicating to us as he says to us, be wise be as serpents and harmless as doves. It means that we are not just wise. We're not just smart. We're not just cunning. We don't just have the information of faith. But we need to be people of balance who learn how to care. It means you have a challenge of caring. There is before you as his disciple, as a follower, to care about other people. And you in that are to be harmless means to be simple, means to be unmixed, it means to be pure, it means to be of one mind. We're going to talk about one mind in just a moment in the Philippians passage, one mind, which is the mind of Christ. But you must be unified. We need to be saying the same thing. We don't need to be saying something different. We need to be sharing one gospel. It needs to be the gospel. We're not trying to raise our own church up. We're not trying to develop our nest. We're trying to express and to expand the kingdom of God. And so we do that with other Christians. We work with others. Can you believe that? We work with other people who are not in our congregation to spread the message of Jesus Christ. We trust and work with other Christians. We are communicating with those people of faith. We realize the width of the web of faith. So, we are harmless as doves. We are of one mind. We're not necessarily... These people uh, who, who during my era of high school, college, who escaped to Canada and called themselves conscientious objectors so they did not have to go to Vietnam, did not necessarily achieve being harmless as doves. Harmless as doves does not mean not going to war. Harmless as doves means being of one mind. It means being together in your thoughts. It means being kind with the message of Christ as you take it out. It is not, you're not deserving of injury. You're not asking for, at the same time, to use trickery in relating to people. We're not trying to do magic shows. So, well, this is what happens. You do not allow, because of what you know, you do not allow your wisdom to degenerate into cunning, nor your simplicity, your unity, to degenerate into ignorance, into naivety. Jesus was perfect illustration. He avoided danger. He was persistent until his hour came. And then the point which he would strike. Then he would say what he needed to say at exactly the right time, in exactly the right place. He was, he was innocent. He was guileless. He was pure in his following. He was not passive in his living, but he came to us with the dynamite of love. He came to us with a message filled with power that caused him to lay down his life. This knowledge that you have of salvation. This is mighty. And it must be shared 
at the right time, in the right place. You must be cunning, you must be wise, and you must be harmless as doves. The passage that Jackie read is about sheep and, and the sheep being led to the slaughter. It's, of course, Isaiah's prophecy of Jesus Christ. It's a very clear picture. If you want to read Isaiah 53 when you go home, it be a great study. That is a great passage to memorize. If that is uh, the truth of what Isaiah said is, is found in Jesus Christ, then Jesus Christ was the one led to the slaughter. But there was a perfect time for that. There was a moment in history when that had to happen, and he calculated, he moved to that. This, this um, invitation that Jesus says to come and to follow me and, and be wise as serpents and harmless as doves, as he sends the 70 out, Luke has a little bit different take on this than Matthew does. Luke says, be, uh, you will be as lambs to the slaughter. You will be as lambs, and not, not, not even sheep. Luke says, you will be lambs. Like Isaiah says, you'll be, he was a lamb. He said, these are, uh, this is the prospect of where you're going if you're going to follow me. You're going to be sent out as lambs among the wolves. You're going to be sent out not just as sheep, but you're going to be sent out as the baby lambs in the wolves. Jesus is sending them not just to a country in which there are wolves. He's sending them in the middle of wolves. He's sending them into the wolf pack. Now, can you imagine this in your mind? Think of the animals and think of a, of a, a lamb going and, and getting in the middle of a wolf pack. The disciples had seen so many times the work of wolves. They had seen the slaughter that they brought to pass where they killed even more than they ate. Their hearts must have been racing. As Jesus said, I'm sending you as sheep into the midst, into the middle, wolves. This would be exposing them to the Pharisees. This would be exposing them to the Sadducees, those harsh, hateful teachers of the law who inhabited and led the church of Israel, the, the, the family of Israel. Here, Jesus says, I'm going to I'm going to put you right in the middle of them. Wise as serpents, harmless as doves. You're going to them. You're going like sheep to the slaughter. You're going like lambs in the middle of wolves. They could potentially be ripped apart, both verbally and literally. These were scholars of the law. These were people who had studied the law all their lives. They memorized the equivalent of the Old Testament. As they had their understanding of the law, Jesus says, you go to them. Go teach them. He was 12 when he started among them to teach and to express the things of God. And he said, and he says to them and he says to you, you have enough knowledge, enough understanding that you can survive in the midst of wolves with the truth that you know you will be able to be strong and communicate the message of faith there. You see, this is the order. Once we experience the forgiving, the loving hand of God, the healing touch of Jesus, we're sent forth to communicate what has happened to us. We are sent without any question into the middle of the world to communicate what we know to be truth. We are to be open and to be honest, and the world uh, that we go into, that makes us vulnerable to crime, that makes us vulnerable to hate, but we are to go with a message still, to be open and honest with them. We're to risk opening ourselves, and this is the reverse of our nature. We want to go into the bunker. We wish that we could hide behind protective walls, never allowing ourselves to get hurt, never allowing ourselves to be spoken against, 
we would be hollow and we would be shallow people if that were the case. Our directive is to be harmless as we go with the knowledge and the experience that we have enjoyed, sharing the kindness and the conviction of Jesus Christ. It's what we do. It's who we are. Bruce Larson wrote a little book called No Longer Strangers. And in that he said, Christian people are not always right. I know that's a shock to some of you because you thought you were always right. They are not always right. They are not always virtuous. They are not always guided. But they are always people who do not defend themselves against the wolves of the world. I love that. What that means is you don't have to cower down. You don't have to hide with this message. You don't have to be fearful about sharing it to the world. Jesus Christ will be with you. He will help you, and He will give to you courage and confidence that you do not have. He will protect you in a way you cannot imagine, and He will allow you to deliver the message of truth. Because He's sending you right into the middle. Don't wait on the edge. Go straight for the center. Always people, we are people who do not have to defend ourselves. We do not have to defend ourselves against the wolves. We do not have to defend God. All we have to do is share the message. We are freed by the power of Jesus Christ to share the grace of God. We're freed. You're free to do that. You are allowed to do that. You are encouraged and empowered to do that. And you can do that like no one else. Well, when do we obtain the mind of Christ? If you look at at the last passage, the Philippians passage, we obtain... That singular mind of Jesus Christ. Can you imagine the mind of Christ? What would that be to have? Paul encourages the Philippians with it. You see, this is the mind of Christ. He has changed history because of his vulnerability. Jesus Christ came with the understanding and the knowledge that he would die. Do you believe you're going to die? You're going to die. We're going to all die. Unless Jesus comes again. And I believe He's coming. I just don't know when it is. But we are going to die. All we determine is how we will live. We don't determine how we're going to die. We determine that in life we will be the people of God and we will deliver this message in the days and the hours that we have. And so He's challenged us. As He opens Himself up to us, we learn about God. Okay? We have learned about God through creation. This is called general revelation. He reveals Himself to us. We know about God because Romans, the first chapter says, you ought to know about God because of this. Look at creation. You can't miss it. But secondly, He has even more completely revealed Himself and who He is in Jesus Christ. In creation, we understand that God has given Himself to us in the act and the method of creation. He's given to us so many riches, so many valuable things. He's given to us freedom to decide if we will use or misuse, if we will exploit, or we will be good stewards of oil and trees and gold. He just gave that to you. God has given you the right and the ability as a human being to live in creation and learn about Him. Have you learned anything about Him from creation? The, the creation is so powerful that some people worship it. It was never meant to be. God wanted you to see Him as the Creator. He didn't want you to worship the creation. But now when He has come in Jesus, He has further exposed Himself profoundly, warmly in Christ because He became one of us. God became one of us. You ever look at the ants? Look at the ants on the ground? I wonder if I could talk to those ants. I wonder if they'd understand anything. You put a stick down in there and you run up and down it and try to bite you. If you were an ant, maybe you could communicate with the ants. Exactly what God did. He became a human being. Not because He didn't know us, but because we didn't know Him. We learn about God from Jesus Christ. We learn who our Creator is. We learn and we discover the goodness of God. There's no match anywhere in history. No one has ever done 
what God did. He revealed himself to us. And in revealing himself to us in Jesus, he risked vulnerability. He risked dying, even the death of the cross. He, he came and he let that happen. He exposed his heart to us. He exposed who he was to us. He let us see his tender forgiveness, his boundless love, and we did not have to search for it. He delivered it to us. He brought it to us in a manger. He communicated to us his vulnerability. He sends us with the same expression of love to the world. It's turned right around. As the Father has sent me what? So send I you. God sent him, and he sends us. And so we go as his representatives, as his ambassadors to the world. Now, if you never want to be used, if you never want to be taken advantage of, if you never want to be cheated, this life is not for you. There's a man who was standing on a dock in Michigan, Lake Michigan actually, and there was a child who was drowning right in front of him. And this man got one of those rings, you know, the rings with a the rope on it, and he tossed it out there, and the kid missed it. He threw it again, and the water was freezing. The kid was beginning to drown. He's going down for the third time. And a woman standing nearby says, Can't you see he's drowning? Help him. And the guy said, Don't you understand? I'm trying to save him without getting wet. True story. But there we are. We want to save the world and not become involved in it. We want to save the world and not get wet. God in Christ became one of us. And we enjoy the privilege of doing the same thing that he has done. We take the risk. The most expensive, expressive exposition of yourself will be, is to be known, is to be understood. Not as a super saint, but a fellow struggler. John 15, 13 says, No greater love is any man than this, than to lay down his life for another. There's no room for personal glory here. These are the real heroes. James says to us, These are the heroes, the ones who take care of the widows and the orphans, the ones who expose themselves to the needs of the world, and they see them and they, go, they operate by reaching them, by touching them. They help the helpless, they find the hurting. Sidney Marshall Gernard, a Christian psychologist, said in a book called The Transparent Self, we must decrease the mystery of our holy selves. We must decrease the mystery of our holy selves. We, we can't be seen as super saints and save the world. We have to be seen as fellow strugglers. We have to be among the community of those who are in need, and we show it, and we serve with that. And in the process, we discover who we really are. This builds, this builds a community of trust. And I have a question to ask you before we go today. Are we a community of trust? Do people trust us? Do they trust us as a church? That's the big question. But do they trust you as an individual? Are you one of them? Are you separate from them? Do you think you're better than them? Are you one who communicates and shares what you have in your heart? Ruth Davis says, No man can come to know himself except that he, as an outcome of his disclosing himself to another person. James says it this way. Read with me. You ready? Confess your faults one to another. Pray for one another that you may be what? Healed. That you may be healed. James says this is how we do it. Nobody has the power to forgive somebody else's sins. No one. Unless they've sinned against you, then you can forgive them. But when we confess to each other, it is for the purpose of praying for one another. It is for the purpose of having knowledge and good understanding so that we may be healed. So, closing. Jesus is saying to us, be wise in avoiding needless danger, but always ready to pay the cost. The cost of discipleship is that you will be vulnerable. He paid a terrible debt 
to bring himself to you and to show you himself. You will also pay a debt to show yourself to another person and to expose your heart in Christ, effectively communicating the love of God. Now, you can be a survivalist on earth if you want to, but it may be that you're homeless when it comes to heaven. You do that. You want to be one who uses the knowledge, the value of the truth that God has delivered to you so that you can bring others with you to heaven. A few will say, that's the life I want. I've been waiting for that. Count me in. Some will say they will remain unchanged. They will remain unaffected. But a few will commit and will follow. Who we want to be? Pray with me. Our Father, we are in need of your heavenly touch to help us grasp the truth of who we are. We know that this comes by being vulnerable and learning from you how to go into the world, how to share what you've given us. Take away our fears, take away our personal issues, so that we might effectively now communicate the love of Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. Hymn of invitation. Let's stand and sing number four, 476 in the garden. 476. Bosch, would you close this?